Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we'll be talking about the situation in Kashmir. And to talk to us about in detail, we're being joined by Prabir Parkayasta, who's the editor of News Click and the president of Free Software Movement in India. Also, we're being joined by Gautam, who is a longtime civil liberties activist. Uh, Gautam, I'll start with you first. Um, 36 ministers are supposed to go to Jammu and Kashmir to do an assessment of what's happening in this region and talk to the people about government's policies and create an interaction in that space. What does this mean? It's very interesting because uh, out of the 36 ministers, only five ministers will visit Kashmir. Out of 59 odd places that they are supposed to visit, only eight are in Kashmir, 51 are in Jammu. So obviously, the, this, if this is an attempt at reaching out to the people, uh, it's primarily targeted at the Jammu uh, people uh, for, compared to Kashmir. Uh, the idea is, of course, the government feels that their all the good initiatives and policies that they have taken are not filtering down because they locked down everything. There is no free flow of information or news to anyone. People don't know what is happening. Uh, except for what uh, they hear through word of mouth. So in such a situation, if the government feels that they, you know, people are not getting to know the good things that are going to come out from their policies and so-called development plans, then it becomes uh, necessary for them to go directly to reach out to people, which actually is an also an admission of failure on the part or the, or the imbecility of the government to have introduced a complete uh, lockdown in Kashmir, which denied not just information, news, or their uh, the freedoms to express themselves, but have actually turned them into virtual captives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to go there to meet captives and to persuade them sounds extremely. Uh, I mean, to my ears, it's 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 uh, it's uh, it sounds very insidious and sinister. I don't get any good feeling or vibes out of this thing. Jammu and Ladakh were two areas where people came out in support of abrogation of Article 370. But the situation has turned. Uh, people have begun to express their deep apprehension about what is in store for them because they're losing their control over and uh, over land and uh, and job opportunities which people fear they'll have to be competing with outsiders uh, they fear loss of power diminution in the status of a state from special status to a union territory which is virtually a colony because they won't have control over two key elements one is police the other is land uh, the Jammu Chamber of Commerce has come out and complained that uh, by making, uh, by removing Octroi, what they have done is destroyed livelihood of three to four lakh people, yeah. robbed them of the jobs because the local industries have to shut down now because that Octroi protection which they enjoyed, which enabled them to produce for a cap for a for a market in Jammu and Kashmir is no longer available because they'll be competing with outside outsiders uh, supplying goods uh, to to the local people. So what happens to jobs and industries? So if government is on the one hand talking about bringing development and industrialization to Jammu and Kashmir, on the other hand, actually the existing industries are going to close down. They are virtually closed. 95% of them are closed in, in Kashmir and about 30% of industry un, industrial units uh, stand closed. It's a staggering economic crisis also that Jammu Kashmir has been uh, faced with now. In fact, Prabhi, that brings me to the next question. Um, the entire internet lockdown that has taken place, it's been 165 days and the kind of suffocation that has been put uh, that has been thrusted upon the people in Jammu and Kashmir is one of the kind. I mean, there are protests, but nobody can hear of it. They want to access information. They cannot. And Supreme Court has talked about lifting the ban and calling it the very basic fundamental right. How do you read this? I think internet is something that we have to worry about today because it is not just a means of communication. It's also a means to express ourselves. So this is what Supreme Court has said that this is also about freedom of speech, which is, as you know, under Section 19, Article 19 of the Constitution, is something that is guaranteed to the citizen, subject to reasonable restrictions. And Supreme Court itself has said in the same judgment on Kashmir that these 
restrictions do not appear to be reasonable and the government should review that. But having said that, they did not go any further and they in fact said the government should review and the court didn't give any further relief and neither has it kept the petition pending, waiting for the government to review and give them a report. So in some sense, you have conceded the substance of the argument on uh, what the internet is a fundamental right today, but at the same time, you have not done anything to make people avail of that right. And unfortunately, this is the problem with the courts these days. They say the right things, but do not follow up with any substantive uh, delivery in terms of justice. But having said that, let's look at some of the other issues that, that happen. You know, it's not only a question of freedom of speech. It is also the question that today, you will need a job. How do you apply? A lot of it is over the internet. You will need an admission outside Jammu mm. or outside Kashmir. You need to go and apply through the internet. The government sets a whole bunch of its schemes are delivered through the internet. And also, if you want to verify a simple thing like your Aadhaar, yes. it is also needs the internet. Yes. If you want rations, again, you need to mm. verify yourself. So the whole bunch of welfare measures, which is what is supposed to be enabled by the internet, this was also the previous government, also this government's claim that they are going to make everything available online. Mm. Now, if you take away that online itself yes. and say it's only available if you come to specific centers, which can be 50 miles, 30 miles, 20 miles from where you are, communication is one thing, but even physical transport, physical going and coming and going is difficult. Again, the all kinds of restrictions. What you're making is, on one hand, you claim that everything should be online, and you will make everything, including education, available online, including applying and so on. At the same time, you say, internet is really a luxury and we can take it away when we want because it's not necessary. So there's a contradiction here in both these issues, what you are promising the citizen and what you say is not necessary for the citizen. I think this is something the courts, unfortunately, while having accepted as a fundamental right, has really, uh, let me say, failed in giving justice to the people because they have made good pronouncements but have had no delivery. Can I, can I yes. pose a question? Because this it requires clarity. Uh, and for most viewers who would not uh, understand, can you explain, Prabir, when the government says that they're going to uh, start, uh, resume uh, mobile internet, but 2G service, what are the implications? Uh, second, when they say that they're going to start broadband services, but only for essential or basic, uh, 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 you know, items like health, I mean, hospitals, banks, and government institutions. What does it mean? See, we know today that 80 to 85 percent of the connectivity today is through the mm. cell phone. So effectively, when you're talking about internet, you're not talking of the wired services. Mm. So you're really talking, as far as the people are concerned, to mobile. Mm. So it's also interesting to see that this, what we're talking about, opening the mobile services, mm -hmm. internet services, only is about a Correct. Okay, so it's about five, five districts. districts. Five districts. Five districts. And these are Hindu-dominated districts. Yeah, let, let us put yeah. that, that issue aside yeah. for the time being. I think we all of us know the implication of Jammu mm. and the valley. Yeah. Yeah. But having said that, it is about Jammu. And obviously, Jammu and Kashmir are being treated differently. differently. And that we know from the beginning. Yeah. In Jammu, again, the city had uh, access to uh, mobile services for 2G. some time, 2G yeah. services for some time. Now it's ex extended to five districts. Again, 2G is a very slow service. So effectively, anything to do with visuals, images, etc. doesn't work on that. Mm. Most of the time you will see today, you will get timed out if you try to upload a form, for mm. instance. Mm. So effectively, it's a crippled service, as it were, that you're offering. No, but it's a, it's a legacy service, if you will. And because of the slow speed of connection, most people will not use it. Second part of it is that you will find that social media is still out of bounds. Yeah. So effectively, you can communicate with government 
services if you want something, registering for something, applying for something. But my whole experience has been that the government services, the websites are also extremely slow. And therefore, if you are look, looking to access the 2G services, you'll probably get timed out before you have done anything except <laughs> look at one page. So effectively, all these services the government gives, I don't think work on 2G. But you know something? My issue is I want hospitals. Mm -hmm. I want to reach something. I want to say register as a patient for an appointment tomorrow. All this today takes place. A lot of it today takes place yeah, on the internet. And how do you do all of that? If you want to apply as a student, would you try even on an internet good connections? You're not able to log in very easily to those kind of forms, apply online and so on. There's no chance that you will be able to do it in 2G. And anyway, Kashmir still lies that only ex fixed places you can go yeah. and you can only see fixed things. You know, that means you can only see certain kind of things, but not others. But the whole, the other part of it, which I didn't answer, actually, I should have. Mm -hmm. How many livelihoods today depend on the internet? Yes. What happens to Uber mm -hmm. drivers and uh, Ola drivers? How, what happens to all those who deliver various services to us? The entire IT-based service uh, companies, units in uh, Kashmir have closed down. Because it's nothing. But I, I'm also saying that the whole informal economy, which is based like from Swiggy, food delivery, to your uh, rides, uh, hailing of rides, a whole bunch of other things yeah. today. Daily life is completely affected. All of yeah. that is affected. Yeah. And then, of course, you have all other problems, communication, which I'm not going into. I'm really talking about mm -hmm. internet, not just as a right to avail of information right to speak. It's also about delivery of services, essential services, and it's also about people's livelihoods, which depend on providing internet-based services. All of that has collapsed. Mayal, I'd like to add something. For the media, internet is vital. It's very important. I mean, work suffers if you don't have access to internet. Mm -hmm. And imagine if this is denied to the media in Kashmir, so you can tom-tom and claim that uh, everything is hunky-dory. Yeah. And our army chiefs can come out and uh, give their political opinion, uh, calling it historic step and things like that. The reality on the ground is very different. But Gautam, it is a historic step. It's historically a very bad step. Yes. Okay. So let's not <laughs> talk. True. Not not let's not quibble about it being historic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the point about media you made, I think, is a very important one. You see, today media can avail of internet if it goes to say places like press club. How many? Place press clubs are there. It's only available, say, in Srinagar. Mm -hmm. How many other places can media people then access information? Mm -hmm. Can you write about things without accessing information? In today's world, you can't. Mm -hmm. You know, so those are the kind of issues mm -hmm. that also come up. That delivery, and here the Supreme Court did make the right pronouncement that information is a right and communication is a part related to freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. So, but as I said, unfortunately, the uh, right exists, you know, during emergency, and I have to break it down to this, that uh, it was said by Dirende, yes, who was Attorney General, mm -hmm. yes, you have the freedom of life, you have a right to life, but it cannot be exercised during emergency. Mm -hmm. So you have the fundamental rights, they are not suspended, but you can't exercise them. So Supreme Court has again reiterated, Freedom of speech is a right and it has to be there, but it has not ensured that it be exercised. exercised. That is the problem we have. Okay, I'd like to add something. While we're talking about uh, all the, what has happened in the last five minutes, I think we should keep reminding ourselves. Uh, the saddest part, I feel, as a civil liberties activist also, is a total lack of concern that... Uh, uh, that we seem to be sh showing for those who have been picked up, arrested, detained. And I'm talking primarily about those, those who have been picked up, incarcerated in Kashmir are being treated one way. But there is a whole body of people, more than 600, who are rotting in Indian jails outside Jammu and Kashmir and they face all kind of obstacles, their families, and they're still there. And there's not a voice, there is not a judiciary which has talked about their rights. So, I mean, what kind of civil liberties and what kind of democracy do we have where 
we are not even concerned. I mean, the normal rules of law that should apply, where families can visit their detainees uh, without any problems or uh, hindrance uh, to meeting the lawyers, to getting their bail applications heard, to etc., uh, etc. Et Everything seems to have been denied to them. This is the worst part, I feel. So we can talk about everything else, but we have to also bring in the fact that so many people and so many kids suffered at the hands of Indian security forces and the police in particular uh, after August 5th. And there has been no, I mean, it's as if we can do anything with the children, which is the, come in the next generation. So we can talk about citizenship. The army chief can talk about uh, constitution and preamble. What, what happens to people on the ground? Thank you, Gautam. Thank you, Prabir. We live in a democracy with an entire state that is captive.